My name is Todd O'Hare. I'm the president and CEO of the Montana Chamber of Commerce, and I'm happy to be co-hosting this with Bob Story, who's the executive director of the Montana Taxpayers Association. Um, as a reminder, uh, please mute your uh, Zoom on your end so that we don't have any sort of background noise and interference that way. And then we are recording uh, the first portion of this meeting so that we can offer it for folks that might want to uh, view this later that couldn't make the state. We will shut off the recording <clears throat> once we get a little further into the session so that we can open it up for some free ranging questions and answers. And so thanks again for everyone for joining us. Um, Bob Story and I got to talking about this about a month ago about the high interest that we see in property taxes. It's kind of the big issue across the state. And Bob Story is undeniably one of the leading tax experts in the state. Uh, Bob served 16 years in the Montana legislature, both in the House and the Senate starting in 1994. So he's seen a lot of the ideas and, and the consternation and the attempts to revise property taxes over the years. And not only did he serve in both the House and the Senate, but Bob also served as chair of tax. And so he understands these issues about as good as anybody in the state of Montana. Bob's from, for those of you that don't know, Bob's from Park City, where he's a fourth generation farmer rancher from that community. And so he's got a lot of great um, roots, deep roots in the state of Montana. And so thank you, Bob, for leading this discussion. And I think what we'll do here to start is Bob's gonna go through a little kind of 101 on property taxes, and then I'll give a report on you know, some of the issues that the governor's property tax task force is considering, and then we'll open it up to Q&A and stop the recording at that point. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Bob. Thanks, Todd, and, and thanks the chamber for setting up the Zoom meeting today, and I'll thank all of you for attending, and we have a great turnout, and, and hopefully it's worth your time to as we go through some things. Now, can you all hear Bob good enough? Great, thanks, Steve. I'll try not to fade. All right, uh, we've got a little slide deck here. I know you all love PowerPoint slides, but we're gonna run through some things. You know, everybody paid property taxes and, and some people understand how it works and some don't. And so I would get requests to explain kind of the basic 101 of, how the property tax system in Montana works and what are some of the challenges that it presents to policymakers when they have to uh, make changes to the system. Now, and for those of you who don't know who the Montana Tax Church Association is, we've been around since 1921 and, and we're, we're the main tax policy organization in the state of Montana. We do a lot of work on all kinds of different tax we also help a lot of the trade associations with their tax policy issues. Okay. So I have a special person on board to do that. All right, just another quick reminder, please mute yourself. So there's all kinds of property in Montana and, and, and most people think that all properties tax the same and that is not the case. Um, we have a, a uh, pretty complex property tax system in the state. And I'm walking you through a little bit of that here um, and, and how, how it works and then get into some of the particulars about where we are currently in the property tax system. So Montana has like many states, but probably has a more complex classified property tax system. We have 16 different classes of property in Montana. And there's a reason that you have a classified system policy-wise that it lets you tax different types of property at different tax rates. It lets you use different appraisal methods on different kinds of property. For example, residential and commercial property are appraised on their market value and ag and timberland are appraised on their productive value. A, a significant difference there. Um, to let you apportion the tax burden. And I've got some charts that will show you how that classification system apportions the tax burden to different types of property. And then it also lets you di use different appraisal cycles. And in Montana, 
most things are now around a two-year appraisal cycle, but you know, some things are appraised annually. At one time, a lot of property was appraised on a six-year cycle, and uh, now most things are back to a two-year cycle. So how are taxes determined? Well, it's a it's basic math. It's a multiplication uh, equation. You take the market value, which the Department of Revenue is required to set by the Constitution. The Constitution, Montana is one of only two states that the state appraises all property. Most states still have county appraisers that do that, county assessors, but Montana is all done by the Department of Revenue. They set the value, and it's really not market value, it's a assessed value because as I said, some things are done on market value, some are done on their cost of replacement, some are done on productive value. That's determined by the department. Then depending on what class of property it lands in, it has a tax rate assigned to it by the legislature. And we'll show you a chart on that in a minute. You multiply those two, you get the taxable value. And that's the number that's important to local governments and state government and schools to figure out how much money they can raise. And then they set a mill levy against that taxable value. And a mill is a thousandth of a dollar. If you think about milliliters or millimeters or mill, a mill is one thousandth. And, and so a mill is a one thousandth of a dollar or a tenth of a penny. And you multiply that times the taxable value and that gets taxed. So if you had a taxable value of of a thousand dollars and you had a mill levy of a thousand mills, your taxes would be a thousand dollars. If your mill levy was 500 mills, your taxes would be five hundred dollars. So, get the next slide. Oh, yes. There's been a lot of consternation since the last reappraisal about what happens, my value went up by 40% and my tax is gonna go up by 40%. That's not the case in, in Montana because ever since 1999, we've had a statutory limit on how much property taxes can increase, how much a local government can increase the taxes they assess, how much the state can increase the taxes they assess. That's embodied in this section law 1510-420, and it allows growth of property tax revenue to a city or county uh, at half the rate of inflation, plus any new property that comes on. So that's the basis of what caps property. Schools have a more stringent cap on their spending. It's basically a, the equalization formula the state has to uh, apply to schools so that they stay within a window of spending that's equalized, um, limits their growth and budgets to what kind of a, a inflation adjustment the legislature pro provides them every two years. And so schools budgets actually, if their student population doesn't change any, their budgets actually don't probably increase as much as cities and counties or state property tax revenue do. So, uh, to get around those caps, then about the only thing a uh, uh, government entity can do is have a voted levy. And that's a point that Todd will talk about later in his discussion of some of the things that they're looking at uh, with voted levies and how you, how you can uh, make those a little more accountable to the public. So this is the classification system we have in Montana. They said we have 16 classes of property. Eight of them are here. Most of the property in Montana is in class four residential and commercial property. 85% of the taxable value of Montana is, is or 85% of the market value of Montana is residential and commercial property. And probably 60 some percent is, is uh, of the taxable value is because there are just a lot of houses and commercial buildings and uh, compared to all the other types of property that we have. Um, the next largest class of property it, it is uh, the electrical distribution systems and the pipelines at class nine property, which is on the next page. But 
Well, I want to talk a little bit about Class 8 business equipment because that's been changed a lot in the last few years, especially under this administration. They've raised the exemption uh, rate on that from $100,000 to $300,000 to a million dollars. So most small businesses and even some medium-sized businesses no longer have to report their business equipment and pay taxes on it. But if you're over the million dollar exemption, if you're up to six million dollars or have seven million dollars of equipment, now you pay it 1.5% times that. And if you're over that, the large industrial guys, any uh, property you have over six or seven million dollars is taxed at 3%. So this slide just shows you the rest of the classes and class nine is one that is important because that is the uh, electrical distribution systems of MDU and Northwestern Energy. For the most part, some of the co-ops that have electrical distribution systems in the major cities are in, have some property in that realm too. Uh, and then all of your transmission type pipelines are, but you can see that tax rate is 12%. That's the highest by far of all the tax rates we have in Montana. And that just means that they pick up a larger share of the tax burden uh, when mills are applied to their value. Then we have a bunch down at the end that have been added over the last few years, you know, 15, 16, 17, and 18. There's not a lot of property in those, none in some of them yet, but they're they were put in place to incentivize uh, different types of uh, development. So here's what I was talking about when you talked about what a classification system does to your tax burden. And so this chart you showed you, if you have $100,000 of property, and it doesn't make any difference what kind of property is, whether it's a house or a farm uh, or uh, electrical distribution system, pipeline, railroad, airlines, whatever, how much taxes you would pay if you were at 500 mills. You can see the diversion there. I mean, a residential property of for every $100,000 of that property at 500 mills pays $675. If you're a class 13 uh, electrical generation or a telecommunication property for every hundred thousand dollars in property because now your tax rate six percent not 1.35 percent you pay three thousand dollars and for every hundred thousand dollars in taxes and if you're a pipeline or the electrical distribution system because of that 12 percent tax rate is nine times what a residential pays now you're at six thousand dollars for every hundred thousand dollars of property and 500 mills is not out of line in montana you know the average mill, by the time you pay your city, county, schools, statewide mills, you're in that five to 600, sometimes up to 800 mill range, depending on what's all on the books there. But this is the thing most people don't understand how diverse that is. And it has two effects. One, if you raise the mill levy, those with the high numbers there pay a larger share of that. Conversely, if you lower the mill levy, those with the higher numbers get a larger tax cut. And so that was some of the discussion going on this summer and well, this winter and last fall was if we lower the statewide mills, we're going to give a lot of those big industries a large tax cut. Well, that's just the way the system works. So who pay, where's the money come from from property tax? And this is a fairly current chart now, and it, it just shows you that almost 58% of the revenue from property taxes comes from residential property for two reasons. One, there's a lot of it. And secondly, you know, most of it's in cities and towns, so it pays not only county and school mills and state mills, it pays city mills. So it has a higher mill levy on it. So that's one of the re two of the reasons that it's such a large portion. The next largest portion is commercial property, the blue up in the corner. Again, a lot of commercial property, also in cities and towns, higher mill levies. And then the third largest portion is that class nine property at 12%, the pipelines and distribution system, about 12% of the property tax comes out of those. 
And people say, well, fine, that's all passed back to the consumers anyway. Well, some of it is and some of it isn't. It depends. You know, if you're a pipeline pipe into Montana, you may be able to pass that back to your consumers or you may have to absorb it. Depends on the competition. The electrical distribution system by law has to adjust their tax rates depending or their Consumer rates depend on what their tax bill does. If tax bill goes up, they can raise their rates. If tax bill go down, they have to re lower their rates. So then the money, where does the money go? And this is the chart that shows that. I mean, the largest portion of it goes to fund schools. And on this chart, there's two, really three different parts of that three different colors are the fun schools. One, one is the um, green, the local schools, 31%. The purple, which is countywide school levies, which fund uh, teacher retirement and transportation is about 6%. And then the state levy, uh, about 20% of the property taxes the state collects, goes into a fund that goes back into the, after the, from this session forward, is used to fund uh, the school, the state share of school equalization money. So, so the bulk of the property tax money goes into the school system one way or the other. Then the counties are the next largest user, and then the cities after that, are the, the cities at about 12%. These are just some graphs that were put together for the governor's committee that just kind of shows what has happened in the market values of these different types of property and the green is residential property. You can see how it kind of went along. It's always increased for the first half of this chart or better is when we were on a six year reappraisal cycle. And so you'd go and then bump up six years and go and then bump up six years. Then in 2015, kind of, oh, up there would be almost to the $150 billion mark went to the two-year reappraisal cycle. And so now you see the bumps every two years. And then you can see that on the right, that spike this year when you had the 47% increase in, in residential property. And then the, the bottom color, the kind of orange down there, that's commercial and it shows kind of what it did. And you see the other ones, they look like they go up, but actually they stay the same or get to be a smaller portion of the thing because they they don't increase much. They, they're pretty stable of egg land and and uh, business equipment and, and other types of property don't don't have those inflationary increases applied to them that happen to residential and commercial property. And that just shows you again what the tax is paid and <clears throat> The property tax system collects over $2 billion a year in Montana by the time you fund all the miscellaneous districts, the schools, the cities, the counties, and the and the state share of revenue, the university system, state mills and such. But again, you can see the growing residential is picking up a bigger share of that. And part of that is because, the, again, the way the property tax System, tax system works when you have to, when cities and counties and schools have to lower their mills because the value is increased, then that tends to shift property between the classes and it gets back to that. When you lower the mills, the people at 1.35% get a lower reduction than the people at 12%. And so that causes a, what you hear about the shift to residential and commercial properties from from the tax mill adjustment. This is just an interesting slide. It doesn't relate a lot to what we're talking about, but just shows you where the growth is. You know, Gallatin County, the red line there, the rapid growth in the last year in their taxable value is huge. Flathead County this year crossed, so they have more taxable value than Yellowstone County. Madison County, small county, residential, you know, a lot of high value residential property down there. More taxable value by far than Cascade, Lewis, Clark, Butte, Silver, both. It's just where the changes in where property is going, where values are going in Montana and, and how that's going to affect policy in the long run of 
how the tax property tax system works. So, so I think with that, that's kind of my few minutes discussion of basic property tax. And then hopefully if you have questions when we get to the end, we'll be able to go more in more depth if you want. But yeah, once we get finished here, we'll open it up to some question and answers. And so thank you, Bob. I think it like as we go forward, you know, we've talked that we may do this again. We want to kind of set a baseline for continuing these sort of conversations. And I would turn next into Governor Gianforte's property tax task force. Uh, the governor put together this task force in February, comprised of about 23 different uh, members representing a pretty diverse swath of Montana, you know, business leaders, and uh, different uh, association groups, uh, legislators, and um, we and I serve on that property tax task force, and so we've started meeting, and so I thought this might be a good opportunity to kind of give a report of some of the things that are under consideration. And I want to be very clear that that these points that I am um, these points that I'm going to be reviewing here, nothing in here is a proposal. These are just some of the ideas that the different subcommittees are throwing out uh, to dig into a little bit more. And so um, once the task force was originally um, put together, then they broke into three different subcommittees focusing on different um, pieces of the property tax. And so the first one that we're going to look at real quickly here is the uh, the local government subcommittee. And I just took a minute to highlight in yellow some of the issues that I thought were uh, kind of most interesting. And I think you'll see some crossover with some of the other subcommittees. Uh, Bob referenced that first yellow highlighted point about uh, timing consideration for mill levy elections. Um, there's a, there's a uh, philosophy or a thought process out there is that when you're looking at school mill levies and some of those sort of mill levies, those are special elections and voter participation is much, much lower than you would see at a primary or a general election. And so there's there's some consideration of like, what would it take to move mill levies so that they are held as a, as a general election sort of voter uh, approved or uh, not approved sort of issue. And so that's one of the issues that's been on. There's a whole lot of other issues associated with mill levies and around the timing of why it is that they do that. But that's one of the issues that has come up. Um, you're going to see this one several times, tax increment finance districts, special improvement districts, bonded debt. How does that affect property taxes in communities when you carve out um, a portion of a city or a, of a town and you uh, consider it a tax increment finance district so that the incremental increase in the property value within that district goes back into financing some of the improvements within that district. Uh, local option sales tax. I know this has been an issue that's been discussed at length, ad nauseum, I would suggest, over the years, but it's back on the table. It's like this is something that might be worth looking at, particularly if we can figure out a better way to, to distribute the revenue that's created through a local option sales tax so that it's more of a regional rather than just, um, I'll pick on Bozeman for a second, rather than Bozeman instituting a local option sales tax and then Bozeman enjoying the benefits of the taxes collected. Is there a way that we can make that more of a revenue sharing sort of a mechanism, particularly if it can be used specifically for the reduction of property taxes? Then there's the California Proposition 13, which essentially puts a limit. We saw a, a kind of an attempt at this in 21, where it was a ballot initiative, CI-121, which would essentially put a cap on residential property taxes. And um, the California Proposition 13 was, I think it was passed in the 70s. It's one of the big uh, limitations for property tax growth in California. Is that something that is uh, something that is worth looking at. There are some pieces from that that might be beneficial for this discussion. Go on to the next committee, and I serve on this tax and this tax fairness and equity subcommittee. Uh, Representative Lou Jones is the chair of that committee, and uh, he started out with a little bullet point of some of the different things that we're looking at. We've spent quite a bit of time talking about the major economic shifts that we see appearing in Montana's economy and frankly have been going on for some time. We saw here within the last couple of weeks news out of Missoula County where Missoula lost two big tax paying 
facilities up there, uh, Pyramid Mountain Lumber, and then there was another sawmill related company in Missoula that both have closed down just within the last couple of weeks. Obviously, when you see that sort of thing happen, um, that tax revenue uh, burden has to be picked up by somewhere else. And so we've seen for a number of years now, Montana's economy continuing to evolve away from kind of this traditional bricks and mortar, big, heavy industrial sort of, of facilities into more of a service economy. And I don't mean service in, in particularly in a negative sense. I mean, we can talk about private uh, professional services. There's a lot of uh, good, good paying jobs in the service economy, but we're seeing a shift. And where is that puck headed? as we look at Montana's economy compared to today and where it's gonna be in 20 years and where it was 20 years ago. Um, there was uh, one of the issues that's on the table that we're digging into and looking at a little bit more is around some sort of a seasonal bed tax. Again, an attempt to try to um, capture some of the revenue that comes from out of state travelers that come to the state. Uh, again, using some of that revenue perhaps to buy down property taxes in those areas where you see those out of state travelers. There's a seasonal gas tax, similar sort of a discussion as the bed tax. Um, maybe you have some sort of a rebate system to Montana citizens or something like that. But again, this discussion around how do you capture the out-of-state tourists that's traveling to Montana during those high tourism sort of issues. And keep in mind, sales tax is not on the table, right? That, that was eliminated from an option from the very beginning. The Montana Chamber has conducted two polls, uh, one in 2019 and one again in uh, 2023, to kind of compare how uh, U.S. or how Montana voter sentiments have changed as it relates to sales tax. And um, it has changed, but it has changed only on the margins. And we can go over that at another webinar, but um, the sales tax is not an option uh, for us to be considering as an alternative revenue source. Uh, again, you see local option tax, and then um, and then there was some discussion around um, tax exempt properties. Think about nonprofits in various communities. Um, all require a minimum level of service, whether you're talking fire or police. And is there some sort of a baseline minimum that needs to be paid by those nonprofit tax exempt properties in communities? Moving on to the uh, education committee, um, highlighted a couple here, and you're gonna see these again, you're looking at the first uh, highlighted yellow bullet point. Uh, again, looking at, is there ways that we should move or should consider um, a school election uh, dates for levies so that you can get better voter participation. And then again, you see tax increment finance districts in that list as well. And there's some others on there, but I didn't wanna like walk through each and every one of them. And so again, I just want to um, highlight that none of these are proposals. Um, these were just ideas that came as a result of the first set of meetings that came from the subcommittees as they report to the full committee. That work is going to continue on. Um, and um, so no one should get overly concerned that these are necessarily proposals. There's a lot of work and homework to go behind, but those are some of the things that those subcommittees are working on. 